Hello there. It yet another day, continuing our networking course, in today's lesson, we are going to continue with the IPv4 addressing. As we have already discussed the class A, B, and C respectively, let continue with the class D and E. We will also look at loopback address and what they do and even link local addresses. You will also understand what a prefix length is, and how to represent IP addresses with prefix notations. Again, we will also look at classless inter-domain routing and why the need for it. Having understood all, we will then look at how, where, and even who manages and controls IP address assignment across the globe. To begin, let remind ourselves of some gist from the previous lesson. In the previous lesson, we discussed what an IP address is. We learned its explanation from both the lay point of view and the technical point of view. We used the student index number analogy to explain further. We also learned about the classes of IP address we have and how we can identify each class of IP address. Again, we spoke about the parts of IP address and how we can split and identify these parts using the subnet mask. In addition, we discussed how we can calculate the number of networks and hosts that the class A, B, and C can have. We further spoke briefly about the types of IPv4 addresses and their significance. If you haven't watched the previous lesson, I will highly recommend that you watch it before continuing with this lesson. Starting with today's lesson, let's see what class D and E IP addresses does. As we already discussed, the class D IP address starts from 224 to 239. And this address range is known as a multicast address. They are mainly used for multicasting. For this reason, we don't assign such IP address range to individual host on a network. Multicasting is the process of sending a packet from one host to multiple or selected group of hosts. In IPv4 communication, there are three main modes of transmission. These are unicast, broadcast, and multicast. We are not discussing the details of these communication modes today, we will do that in later lessons. Now, going back to this multicast address, this address ranges between 224.0.0.0 and 239.255.255.255. They are reserved for use by routing protocols inside a network. On a network, any host can send and receive multicast datagrams. But to receive a multicast message, a host must be configured to join that multicast address group and to receive on that multicast group. All hosts that are configured to receive packets on a particular address become part of a multicast group for that address. Let's look at some real-world examples of multicasting. One example we can talk about is a live video streaming or conferencing. In a live video stream, a host sends traffic in one stream to a multicast group. This helps to deliver high-quality, low-latency video to a large audience in real time. The video stream is sent from the source through a protocol called Real-Time Messaging Protocol well known as RTMP to the streaming server which is part of a multicast-enabled or configured network which distributes the stream to all interested recipients simultaneously. So, in simple terms the streaming source sends a single stream of data over the network, which is then replicated and sent to multiple recipients who are interested in receiving the content. This is achieved through the use of network protocols, such as Internet Group Management Protocol popularly known as IGMP and Protocol Independent Multicast also called PIM. We shall see how these configurations are done as we advance in later lessons, but for now, this is an overview of how multicasting work in a multicast-enabled network. Another example of multicasting is Video On Demand. Video On Demand gives users 
the ability to play, pause and to record or download their favorite videos at any time anywhere. Before the existence of social media and its associated live streaming, video on demand technology existed. In traditional context of video on demand, it was usually supplied through purchased decoders usually referred to as Firebox. These decoders forms part of a multicast group of their various service providers multicast network where these pre-recorded videos are stored. But in today's modern context of video on demand, it can be referred to as any pre-recorded video content that you watch over the internet. Video streaming services such as Amazon Prime, Apple TV, and Netflix are some common examples of today's modern video on demand platforms. So, all of these services are made possible through multicasting enabled routing using class DIP addresses. The last IP address class we will talk about is the class EIP address. The first octet of class EIP address ranges from 240 to 255. These address group are not used. They are reserved by the Internet Engineering Task Force also called IETF. They have reserved this for research purposes. For this reason, we will not talk much about it. Now, let's quickly talk about loopback address. The term loopback means routing of a signal or data stream from its original source and back to the origin. The purpose of doing this is mainly for troubleshooting and to test the network connectivity. This address ranges from 127.0.0.0 and ends at 127.255.255.255. Whenever a device sends a packet to a loopback address, that traffic is processed by the TCP IP protocol stack within that same device without transmitting it to the entire network. Let's see an example of this. I am using a Cisco packet tracer for simulation. If this is your first time seeing this, do not worry about it. I will brief you on this later during our lab sessions. Here, I have two computers connected together by a switch. On this PC, I have assigned this IP address, and on this one, I have assigned this IP address. Let's see how the packet behaves if I send a ping request from this IP address to this one. Now, you can see, the packet is being sent to this PC and a reply back to the sender. Again, let now send a ping request, but this time, to the loopback IP address. You can see there is still a reply, but this time being processed just within this PC. As rightfully said, it is used as a source and destination address for testing network connectivity within the local device. The address 127.0.0.1 is the most commonly used loopback address and is usually called local host. This is because, usually, local host as a host name is mostly mapped to the address 127.0.0.1 amongst the loopback IP address group. We can also say loopback addresses are logical, meaning they are not assigned on a physical interface or a network interface card. For example, on my computer, there is no network. In other words, my physical network card has no IP address assigned as you can see. But when I ping the loopback address, I will get a response, indicating that my system's logical TCP IP stack is working correctly. Loopback address is also used to test network-based applications by hosting them locally and accessing it on the same device. 
For example, before deploying a website on a production server, you can host and access the website locally using the loopback address. Now, let's look at what link local address is. Link local addresses are in the block 169.254.0.0 through 169.254.255.255. These addresses are used by the DHCP auto configuration service on a system. When a DHCP address could not be obtained, Link local addresses allow you to have network connectivity until another more suitable address can be obtained. For example, in this local network configuration, if I set the IP configuration of this PC to automatically get the IP address from a DHCP server, you can see that a link local address will be obtained. This is because, there is no proper DHCP server configured on this network. And even if one exists, it may not be functioning properly for some reason. When this happens, a link local address would be given to this PC, until a proper DHCP is configured to assign a proper IP address. This process is also known as automatic private IP addressing popularly known as a PIPA or stateless address auto configuration. You can also check link local address by this other way. Open the command prompt. Type IP config and press enter. This is the link local address obtained. Routers does not route link local addresses. Let's now look at CIDR. CIDR means classless interdomain routing. As we already know from the previous lesson, IP addresses were mainly assigned using the classful IP address technique. Using this classful technique, Networks were usually too big or too small for most organizations to use. The smallest allocation and routing block contained 254 addresses which is larger than necessary for personal or departmental networks, but too small for most enterprises. The next larger block contained 65,534 addresses which is also too large to be used efficiently even by large organizations. Again, for network users who needed more than 65,534 addresses, the only remaining size gave them far too many, more than 16 million addresses. This led to inefficiencies in address use, as well as inefficiencies in routing. In 1993, the Internet Engineering Task Force realized that these techniques were not efficient as technology advances and the Internet rapidly expands to other parts or the world. There came the need to introduce class-less interdomain routing. A new method for allocating and assigning IP addresses for public use. Now, from the previous lesson, we saw that IP addresses consist of two parts. The most significant bits, which constitutes the network prefix also called the network address. This part identifies a whole network or subnet. And the other part of IP address, which is the least significant bits, forming the host address. This part also identifies a particular host on a network. Unlike classful IP address, where there is only three IP blocks and causes inefficiency in IP addresses assignment, the CIDR is based on variable length subnet masking also called VLSM. With CIDR, the network prefixes have variable length, meaning they are not fixed. With this, we can efficiently divide a network into smaller subnetworks. The main benefit of this is that it gives more control of the sizes of subnets allocated to organizations, therefore preventing the allocating of larger subnets than needed. This brought about a new way of writing IP addresses known as CIDR notation. 
With this, an IP address is followed by a suffix, indicating the number of bits used as the prefix or as the network address. For example, if I write an IP address like this, with slash 24, this is the suffix I'm talking about. This suffix means that, when we write down the subnet mask of this IP address, the network portion of this IP will contain 24 ones. Starting from the left to the right. The ones here are 24, and this forms the prefix or the network portion of the address. Converting this into decimal we get this. So, this is the subnet mask of this IP, and its prefix notation is slash 24. Again, in this IP address, the slash 18, is the suffix and it means that, 18 ones make up the prefix or the network portion of the address. Writing down the subnet mask in binary we will have this. Here, you can see that, in the third octet, there has been some changes which is the two bits over here. This is because, to get the 18 ones we need to borrow two bits from the host portion of the address. So, converting this into decimal we get, 255.255.192.0 which is now the subnet mask. Now, to calculate the number of networks we can create in this IP, we go by the formula, 2 exponent n, where n, is the number of bits borrowed. Evaluating this, we get, 2 exponent 2 which is equal to 4 networks. And calculating the number of hosts each subnet can have, we go by the formula, 2 exponent n minus 2, where n, is the number of host bits remaining. Evaluating this, we have 2 exponent 14 minus 2 which is equal to 16,382 hosts. We shall learn how to write down these IP blocks after doing these calculations in later lessons. Let's take the last example. In this IP address, the suffix 25 means that 25 bits makes up the network portion of the address. Writing down the subnet mask in binary, we have this. Here, you can see that we have borrowed one bit from the host portion of the address in the fourth octet. Converting this into decimal, we get 255.255.255.128 being the subnet mask. Now, calculating the number of networks, we go by the formula, 2 exponent n, where n, is the number of bits borrowed. And here we borrowed one bit. Evaluating this, we get, 2 exponent 1 which is equal to 2 networks. Now, calculating the number of hosts, we get 2 exponent 7 minus 2. And this is equal to 126 host. Don't forget that, 7 is the remaining host bits over here. So, this means, in this IP with the CIDR notation, slash 25, we can create two networks, with each network having 126 hosts. Don't worry we will know how to write down these IPs in later lessons. So, this is the flexibility and efficiency CIDR brought in the assignment of IP addresses. Let now talk about the big question. Who manages and controls public IP address allocation? The IP address space is managed globally by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority well known as IANA, a Department of Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, popularly known as ICANN. IANA operates through five other regional Internet registries which also render their job in their designated territories. These five regional internet registries are, 1. American Registry for Internet Numbers, for Northern America. 2. Rezo IP Europeans Network Coordination Center, for Europe. 3. Latin America and Caribbean Network Information Center, for Southern America. 4. African Network Information Center, for Africa. 
5. Asia-Pacific Network Information Center, for Asia-Pacific Regions. These five regional internet registries, receive address blocks from IANA, and allocate them to the National Internet Registry within their regions. National Internet Registry also allocates IP blocks for assignment to local internet registries, such as internet service providers, and other telecommunication companies. The internet service providers will then assign IP blocks to their respective customers, such as organizations, institutions, companies, etc. This is the flow of public IP address assignment. We will end today's lesson here. I believe you have understood the concept of IP addressing. Thank you for watching. Kindly subscribe to our channel and share for others to watch. See you in the next lesson.